I'll wait for the recording to start. Okay. Um, so thanks, Axel. Thank you for coming. I'd like happy to introduce our today's guest talk. Uh, Axel, Axel Ngonga Ngoma from the University of Paderborn is here to talk to us about his research and the relationships between, I'm going to just throw out two terms, graph theory and reinforcement learning. Um, so Axel, I have known for about five years, maybe even a little bit more. He has a professorship here in Germany. When I met him, he was at the University of Leipzig, where I believe he uh, started his, his studies. He finished his PhD, I believe, in Leipzig. And he then moved um, a couple of years ago, I think three to four years ago, yeah. to another university in Germany. And um, yeah, I'll, I won't say much more than that, other than, um, yeah, I think he's been, he spoke to us in the last batch and we we kind of fell out of touch in between because we got busy trying to figure out what we were doing. But as we go forwards and uh, keep working on the next editions of training, I think Axel is somebody that we'd love to help work with us on designing some challenges. And I think you and Yabibel have already spoke on putting yes, together one of these big yeah. challenges. So Absolutely. excited, excited to have you on board. Um, and yeah, over to you. Thanks. So thank you all for being here. Uh, one thing before we begin, uh, I have to use my iPad, whatever thing. And the problem here is I cannot see you whilst I'm giving the talk. So if I, I'll try to swap and just make sure that I, I check whether there are comments and th or things. But if I don't react to anything, it's simply because I cannot see you. I can really only see my slides, which I apologize for. Um, can you see my slides now? So I try to share my screen. Not yet. Uh, okay, can share your screen. Let's try that again. Uh, well, let's try the entire screen then, shall we? You're going to see yourself a lot of times. Okay. Yeah, that's where you right. can. Yeah. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Slides. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So. Um, the topic for today is going to be hybrid learning on knowledge graphs. And uh, just to give you a summary, what I want to point to is the fact that given that knowledge graphs are very popular nowadays, they are used in most of the Fortune 500 companies uh, as a means to represent data, uh, we might want to think about the type of machine learning that we can carry out on knowledge graphs. And it turns out that by combining different representations of knowledge graphs, which I'm going to uh, talk about in a sec, we can actually exploit results from gaming to make uh, machine learning on knowledge graphs better. And the uh, machine learning on knowledge graphs, at least the way we perform it, has the main advantage of being what is called anti hoc globally explainable. So it's not only that it performs well, it also gives you. Um, the necessary to explain why it performs a certain way. And that is basically a major win for a plethora of applications. Um, and that's fundamentally what I want to talk about today. Let me see, let me make sure that this works so that we can actually get uh, cracking here. Okay, introduction. So um, when I talked with Yabeba, he pointed out that I really didn't tell you much about me last time. I presented and it was like, oh, yeah, please do have a slide for that, which is this one. So who am I? I'm Axel, hi. I was born here in a little city in Cameroon. It's not really that little, in a city in Cameroon called Bafusam on, on uh, August 83. And uh, on the same day we moved, we moved to the city where I spent most of my youth, which is called Boya. It's the city under that little blue line. And Boya is a city in the English speaking part of Cameroon, my parents are. French speaking, so basically I grew up in a bilingual, a trilingual household. And uh, yeah, once I was done with my uh, school degrees, I moved to here, which is Leipzig. And Leipzig is a city in East Germany, not an hour really away from Berlin. And that's where I spent basically most of my formative years. That's where I did my master's and my PhD, as well as my second PhD, ego my habilitation. And uh, roughly five years ago, I moved to Paderborn, which is this that little city over there, uh, where I uh, lead the group on data science. So our research areas are things, it's basically everything that has to do with the extraction of knowledge graphs, storage of knowledge graphs, and obviously machine learning on top of knowledge graphs. And what I want to talk about today really is machine learning on top of knowledge graphs. Um, 
and to tell you or to point out why it's so important to have explainable machine learning and how explainable machine learning is linked to knowledge graphs, I want to start with a few stories really. So story number one um, is the, um, and this is a real story, a judge um, used an, a machine learning algorithm to decide as to whether particular people were supposed to pay bail or not, ergo, uh, if somebody was incarcerated, the person could request to pay a bill and get out. And um, the judge basically used a simple a binary classifier to say yes or no. Um, it turned out that the binary classifier basically uh, returned results which were unexpected. And a few machine learners then actually took that classifier apart and it turned out that that particular classifier, which was a black box classifier, actually preferred releasing people based on their skin color. That is something that is simply not acceptable. Um, one of the reasons why we actually need to know what's happening in machine learning algorithms when we use them in everyday life. A second example in this area uh, is a judge who decided to release a prisoner because a machine learning algorithm, a regression algorithm, basically computed that the probability of said person committing a crime post-release was extremely low. Um, turned out that that was not the case. The guy was back in jail a few weeks later. Problem here, again, um, the machine learning, there was, it was simply a, a data input error, but that data input error, so the value for that data point was so unlikely that an explainable AI algorithm would have pointed out that something's fishy about this data point, or at least this data point is an outlier vis-a-vis -vis the correlation between the values. So that's story number one. Number two, uh, automated decision-making with respect to credit. So it turns out that banks also use machine learning algorithms um, to classify you as being worthy of credit or not. Ergo, should, I, should they give you money or not? Or how much money should they give you? And it turns out that uh, a thorough study of the machine learning algorithms used by certain major banks um, showed that they actually relied on a feature such as your geospatial location. Ergo, if you were from a particular area of the city, you would not get a loan from them or you would not basically get a credit card from them simply because they were like, you're really unlikely to repay them. Basically what your neighbors did affected you. And that is again, uh, a form of, um, yeah, result from machine learning algorithm, which we would rather not want to see. And uh, something that should be close to Arun's heart um, is the third example here, predictive policing. So um, it turns out that the city of Berlin uses a uh, predictive policing software. Um, it's been around since 2016. It's called uh, Crime Pro. And what it does is it tries to predict um, where crime is going to happen in the city of Berlin. And then basically that's where you send the corresponding police forces. First of all, a priori, a very good idea, but because it's not explainable, the people who use this piece of software tend to or have the potential to over-arrest people. Ergo, if you look fishy, even if you actually didn't do anything, because you're in the red zone, the likelihood of you seeing jail at least for a couple of hours is obviously larger. Those are just some of the applications, some of the real-life applications of uh, uh, machine learning, which basically show on the one hand that machine learning really has an influence on our everyday life, I mean, an increasing influence, and uh, there are ever more applications which are based on machine learning. On the other hand, they also show that we need to be able to explain or understand what's happening in machine learning algorithms. So um, that basically motivates the fact for we need explainable AI. We need machine learning models to be explainable in some way. But what does it really mean to have explainable AI? So classically, um, the machine learning algorithms that you will use and deploy will work this way. If we assume that we're dealing with supervised machine learning here, you'll have some training data of sorts. Um, you will decide on an algorithm or a set of algorithm, an ensemble algorithm is also possible. Uh, and using that algorithm and training data, you will learn a function. This is basically this guy over here. And uh, given a certain a new input, you will basically compute some output, which is uh, in the case of a regression, you will basically compute a continuous value. In the case of a classification, you are basically going to map a uh, set input to a, a particular class or a set of classes. Now, 
in the case of the judges, that would have been like put this guy in jail or release this guy from jail and so on and so forth. Now, what we want when we say explainable AI is basically we want the user to be able to ask certain questions or to really get answers to a particular set of questions. And depending on the definition that you use of explanation, these questions would be different. So for example, in this user will want to ask why so expensive. So what the user is really saying is what are the features which led to the price in the, in this case, it's a regression to this price of 600, uh, 699,000 euros. Uh, why is it so expensive? Show, show me your math, basically. How did you come, come up with this number? Can I trust this is really explain your model to me or explain um, how the, uh, the number really came about vis-a-vis -vis other data points, for example? And uh, can I find errors? So what would have happened if I had changed a few features here would the price have changed significantly given my background knowledge, for example, I know that it shouldn't have. These are the types of questions which uh, one wants to be able to ask when one thinks about explainable AI. So there is, funnily enough, no fully agreed upon definition of what an explanation is. What is agreed upon really is that there are different types of explanations most probably, and that depending on the different types of explanations, you're gonna need a different types type of explainable AI. Um, you're gonna need explainable AIs which can explain the global output of a machine learning model. That's basically uh, what this really means is being able to take the whole machine learning model and telling a user how that whole machine learning model behaves. There are also local explanation models, of course, which only say how a model behaves or a model behaves within a certain limited portion of the space it can be deployed in. Um, and if possible, it is agreed upon that if possible wants that to be anti-hoc. And anti-hoc is just a fancy word to say you don't want to deploy an explanation model on top of a black box model, you actually want the model itself to be explainable, right? Um, another type of explanation, which one, which is often required by users is explaining important features. That's something that you did when you were thinking about this course of graph, basically uh, evaluating which features influence the classification. And then there's also explanation via counterfactuals. This third point is actually quite important as well. And uh, what it really says is that users also want to know what they should have changed for the classification to be different. So if you take the example of the person with getting a loan from a bank, um, the person could ask, hey, what do I need to do to be able to really get this loan? And uh, the algorithm could reply something like, move house, go to a different part of the city and all, all be fine. It's not always feasible, but that, that is basically um, an explanation which would help the user at least to some degree. Okay, so my claim for today will be that learning on knowledge graphs can provide you with these different features, um, that it is it can be implemented in an anti-hoc, globally explainable, explainable way, number one, and uh, that it also supports counterfactuals. And the reason why this is important is, as I've mentioned at the beginning, simply the fact that there are a plethora of applications which rely on knowledge graphs nowadays, uh, whether this is seen at the user interface level or not. Um, Google is a good example. I mean, everybody uses Google, everybody that's not correct. Four billion people use Google on the planet at the moment, roughly. And um, when you search for any entity, really, you get this cute little box at the right-hand side. That's basically a, a portion of the Google knowledge graph. And if you ask for how your team performed in the last event, you basically get the score directly displayed. That's also part, a portion of the knowledge graph, right? Facebook uses knowledge graphs to basically uh, connect people with other types of things. And out of that, they basically run prediction algorithms, for example, to show you advertisement, to say, if in your posts, you often mention mentioned guitars, for example, then we should we could show you advertisement for guitars, but we could also show you advertisement for guitar picks or for amps because amps are related to guitars and people who, need, who use guitars usually use amps. So things of the sort. The BBC uh, basically used uh, or still uses knowledge graphs actually to generate their front page. 
So if you are looking for, for soccer, for example, they'll not only show you soccer, they'll also show you soccer players because soccer and soccer players are related within the BBC knowledge graph. Okay, so number one, knowledge graph important, but important, they are available, they are used widely. And number two, if you do your machine learning on knowledge graphs right, you actually have these uh, well-wanted characteristics of explainable AI, and you can present end users with explanations as to what your system has learned. And you can even get end users to ask questions and give answers as to what they would have to change to basically be classified a different way. So what I wanna do today is uh, first give you a short formal introduction to knowledge graphs because I'm pretty sure not all have seen knowledge graphs before. Let me just check, get back to the window. Have, is, is there anybody in here who's never heard of knowledge graphs? Uh, how do we make, make that? Can you just write a plus one in the chat? A hand, oh, some people have raised hands. So oh, you can raise hands here, oh, cool. Yeah, okay, good. So I'm first gonna tell you quickly what a knowledge graph is and then show you how one has learned up to now on knowledge graphs and how we basically use reinforcement, reinforcement learning to make that better. That's kind of our agenda here. Excellent. Okay. Can I just ask quickly, you gave examples yes. of companies that do use knowledge graphs. Yes. Are there any yes. AI examples that do not use knowledge graphs? There are plenty of AI examples which do not use knowledge graphs, at least explicitly. So if you consider, let me check, um, um, Satsen, for example, they do image classification for the uh, European Union, and their job is to detect whether something has happened in a particular region for which one actually needs to deploy, for example, uh, say emergency uh, um, emergency materials or, or basically run an emergency. And they are based on vectoral data, so they use map data, for example. But uh, what is quite interesting there is that um, you the data that they use can be described via a knowledge graph. So although they are using black box model for classification at the moment, uh, what we're working on or what we plan to work on with them is really taking the knowledge graph representation of the data. And in addition to just having the classification do or do not to really generate explanations as to why we think that one should or should not really perform a certain operation or basically forward information to the corresponding authorities. Axel, there's two questions. I don't know if you want to take them now or at the end. Yeah, sure. No, let's go for it. Smench and then Christian. Does machine learning worry about shape of graphs? It depends on what you call a shape. So uh, I hope we're not mixing up graphs and networks here. So what I mean a knowledge graph is really a network of things. And I'm going to show you an example in a second. And uh, basically, the uh, knowledge graphs have a formal syntax and a formal semantics. And uh, given that that is fixed, the machine learning algorithm will not worry about the shape. It will just worry about things like uh, consistency with the ontology. But I'll talk about that in a second. Does machine make better decision than human? Well, that's a very broad question. Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, machines perform better decision making in some cases, especially in cases where there are very large amounts of data and a lot of um, basically background data to train on. So if you look at the game of chess, for example, their machines perform better or perform, yeah, perform better than humans simply because you can train them on millions and billions of uh, games if necessary. But there are other tasks where humans are significantly better. So um, if you consider the problem of, for example, uh, spotting things in images, humans have bring a lot of uh, background knowledge with them. So they are often better than machines machines that tasks like that or driving a car humans are still better still better than machines at that so i have seen usgs i don't know what usgs stands for us geological survey that was oh us geological survey okay yeah um i'm not completely sure as to how they use knowledge graphs so i know that the us um has knowledge graphs in place for public data. And the idea that they have there is that they make the data available in such a way that you can easily fetch a bunch of data sets and actually uh, merge them and merge them then to use them in further applications. And I guess that's how USGS is using data. 
do you use something Bayesian model in your algorithm? Well, we'll talk about the algorithm in a second, then you'll get an answer to that. Um, any further questions before we move on? I think I've uh, dealt with the first batch of questions then. Let's move on then to uh, knowledge graphs and what that is. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to focus really on so-called RDF knowledge graphs. RDF stands for Resource Description Framework, and it is a W3C standards, which be standard, which basically tells you, number one, what the syntax of an RDF knowledge graph looks like, and number two, what the semantics of an RDF knowledge graphs are. What I mean by syntax is really how do you write down an RDF knowledge graph? What's the formal model behind that? And what I mean by semantics is what you can really infer from an RDF knowledge graph using something like a reasoning engine. So uh, let me just show you an example here. So formally, every uh, RDF knowledge graph is a graph G, which uh, consists of two parts. Basically, some people call it the network. Uh, v is a set of vertices. E is a set of edges. And uh, V will be the set of all resources. And a resource is really something which has a unique name. So if you consider, for example, something like, uh, let's say, Booyah, right? This would be considered a resource because it is a, it is a thing which has an ontological meaning. It exists, really. Um, it doesn't mean that resources must exist physically. They can exist in your mind. So. If you think, for example, of a dinosaur with three heads and you call it the tri triceratops, you could give that uh, a URI. You could give it basically a name, a unique name, and it would be considered a resource. Commonly, we'll say resource is something from the domain uh, of interest which you, can, which you want to describe, right? So let's say Boya, for example, is a resource. We will now define the set of edges, which are in an RDF knowledge graph. And as you can see, an edge is considered a triple, really. And it maps a resource and another resource via a property. So for example, you could say something like, uh, if we have Cameroon here, forgive my handwriting, it's not easy to write on a, on a glass monitor thing but you could have for example located in okay so you basically have a predicate here which, which is located in that would be the arrow in the middle you would have uh cameroon as uh, a resource and boya as a resource and uh, we would call this an assertion uh, some people also call it a statement and a knowledge graph is nothing else than a, a, an rdf knowledge graph is nothing else than a state a set of statements right and the reason why it becomes a graph is if you imagine that you have a second statement on on boya say for example boya is located in the southwest province of cameroon then instead of thinking of, of it as a separate statement which has nothing to do with statement before because you share the boya subject you will basically write it by adding simply an edge here saying this is the Southwest province. I'm just gonna uh, write a shorthand version here and you could write here the same located in, right? So yes, this particular edge uh, located, that Boya is located in uh, the Southwest prov Southwestern province of uh, Cameroon. That's yet another statement, but as you can see, the more statements you have, the more interconnected they are, the more of a network you will be built. So formally, the notation that I give you is uh, incorrect in the sense that formally an RDF knowledge graph is a so-called hypergraph, which basically means that one would have to write it technically this way, where we have B Boya, we have Cameroon, we have located in, and we have the Southwestern province. And I would say the first statement is one edge which looks like this, and the second statement is an edge which looks like that. Note that these edges basically contain several nodes in, and not only two. So they don't only link two nodes, they link three nodes, but basically for the sake of, of uh, easier read, uh, I usually use this notation, but technically correct would be the notation at top. Okay, so that's what you need to know. A, uh, an RDF knowledge graph is a hypergraph, a basically a so-called order three hypergraph because it connects three things. Each edge connects three things, and those things are resources and predicates. Okay, so now 
we can uh, go, that's basically tells you something about the syntax of RDF knowledge graphs. Let's talk about semantics now. So what uh, do, does an RDF knowledge graph mean? And the answer is it depends. It depends on the formal logic which you put on top of your RDF knowledge graph. One formal logic which is commonly used is the ALC. Uh, who has never heard of first order logics before? Okay, one hand. Okay, so so there are a few people who've never heard of first order logics before. So technically, when you're doing first order logics, you you can basically do right things like, and you've used this in math all the time. It's probably simple. Wasn't called first order logic, but you can say something like, for all x, there exists a y such that f of x equals y. Right. So what you are basically saying here is that f is a function. Right. Uh, for, for and you can usually write something like for all x which belong to a certain domain, there exists a y such that f of x is equal to y. And you the second condition which you often have is if uh, f of x equals y and uh, f of x equals y prime, then y is the same as y prime. So basically, you're saying if a function cannot assign two values to one x, you basically say. Uh, D is the domain of definition of, of uh, F, and uh, yeah, F is a function. That's normally what you see here. And the notation which you say is really called first order logics. It really just says that you're looking at um, particular things, and the statements that you make are about those things and not about the indexes which are built upon these things. Then you'll be in second order logics, and if you build indexes upon indexes, then you're in third order logics, and so on and so forth. So let me repeat my question. Who's never heard of first order logics before? Zero. What? Was that was there a hand or was there no hand? There was no hand, right? So you've all seen this notation before, and that's really what is called first order logics. And uh, what we uh, do with knowledge graphs is we really apply first order first order logics to describe the meaning of a statement and what you can infer from statements which are parts of graphs. Let me just get rid of uh, some of the paint at least so that I can write stuff. Oh, I mean, it will just disappear in the next one anyway. So um, the logic which is most commonly used is uh, ALC. And ALC is really just a portion of first order logic, which is uh, defined as follows. Um, number one, we say that we have concept names. And a concept name is nothing else than a class. So for example, you can say persons and places and um, amenities, those are all concepts. And uh, once you have concepts, you can then connect concepts to each other via negation, via conjunction, disjunction, Existential restriction basically just says that you can define roles and the role really just tells you a relation between things. And you can say that particular concepts are defined via the relationship to other concepts. For example, every parent is a person who has a child. So the definition of the parent, we basically look at the has child relation and say, does a has child relation exist? That's really what this existential restriction is all about. And uh, you can you have universal restrictions where you can say, uh, if you are a human parent, then all of your children must be human. So if the relation between a, per a person and another person exists via the parent relationship, then basically the person who is the child should be a human for us to define the parent as human. That would be one possible definition of a, a human parent. Okay, now what's important is when you learn on knowledge graphs, these are really the type of things that you will learn. So instead of learning black box models like you're used to learning, where you really have, um, if you think about it, it is really a decision boundary in a high dimensional space. And uh, most often that high dimensional space is so high dimensional that humans cannot understand it anymore. What you have instead is a class expression. So basically, a, com a combination of a classes via the uh, different uh, um, constructs which I just showed you. And most importantly, this type of models, ego class expressions, can be verbalized. So what we can do is we can actually take a class expression like this one, 
uh, who can guess what this actually means? Just just guess. Yeah, it's, it's fine to just guess whatever. Uh, please show us again. Yeah, sure. So who can guess what that means? So that class expression can be verbalized with, as person with at least one child. So basically would we'll say parent, right? And if you look at the next one, this would be the set of animals that eat, uh, that should not, that should be a T, not the CH, that only eat plants. And uh, yeah, the next class would be the class of professors or students. And uh, yeah, let's see, can you guess the last, the last one? Person uh, wherever born in a city. Okay. Exactly, persons who are not, not born in a city. So cool. So in basically less than five minutes, you know how to verbalize class expressions, which means if this were the machine learning models that we generated, then we would have machine learning models, which are such that, I mean, FYI, this can be done automatically, of course, which means we'd have machine learning models which can be understood by humans. And what I want to point out is that Yes, it has been possible to do that uh, already, but what we've basically been working on is uh, making that happen uh, in a better way using reinforcement learning. Um, let's look at the learning problem in itself. And this is now gonna go rather quick. It's not important that you understand all the details. Uh, uh, more important is that you get an overview of how it works. So classically, if you're doing supervised machine learning, you are giving a set of positive and negative examples, right? So in the case of class expression learning, this will be positive and negative individuals. Uh, we are going to denote them E plus and E minus. And as you can see, those are subsets of the set of all individuals which are available in the knowledge graph. Individuals basically being a fancy term for resources. So something like Boya and Cameroon and so on, the example I showed you before. What uh, machine learning or what class expression learning, which is machine learning or knowledge graphs really has in addition is this background knowledge. And um, the background knowledge K is often regarded as being two things. You have a T box. The T box really expresses simply the ontology. It tells you which relations exist between classes. For example, that a, uh, a person can have a job that a city can be located in a province or can be located in a country and so on and so forth. It basically just describes the background, uh, the domain in which you are, whilst the set of assertions really tells you what I just showed you in the RDF. It basically tells you things such as the city of Boya is located in the southwestern province of Cameroon, right? So that's the set of assertions. Um, what you're also given is a formal language I'll just describe that. Let's assume that it's ALC. Uh, don't worry about that too much. And uh, the most important bit really is that commonly when you do class expression learning, you're given a scoring function. And that scoring function is going to be the key to actually decide as to how to run your machine learning. So the scoring function is going to tell you how good a class expression is vis-a-vis -vis the set of positive and negative examples which were given to you. Uh, your job, ego, given these five points, background knowledge, positive and negative examples, a uh, formal language and a scoring function, is really to find a class expression C, which is such that it describes the positive examples and does not describe the negative examples. So if you imagine that you're given the set of city, a set of cities uh, in Cameroon and a set of cities, say, in Rwanda, and your, the set of cities in Cameroon are the positive examples and the ones in Rwanda are the negative examples, you would want to learn a class expression which looks like, like this, exists located in Cameroon. And that's, that would basically be the model you would learn and uh, that's something you could verbalize and then present to an end user. Now, uh, the remarks basically just tell you that that's not always possible. So you can easily build um, settings where it's impossible to have to find a perfect class expression. And for, for some formal logics, really, it um, 
makes little sense to use the whole power of the formal logic. But don't worry about that, those are details. Okay, so how do the algorithms which have been used so far really do this? They regarded the problem as a search problem. And the idea was that one would define an operator on a space. I will show you the space in a second. And basically use this Q function, this quality function to actually traverse the space. And the way it works was as follows. Uh, one would basically start with the most generic concept. If you are looking at a top-down uh, approach, the most generic concept would then be used to generate possible solutions. So basically that's this step. In the first step, you would, for example, generate this set of possible descriptions. So imagine again that we're looking at, uh, in this example, we're looking at persons which uh, work in at universities, and we're basically trying to find a class expression which describes some positive examples and does not describe some negative examples. So we'd first start with the most generic uh, concepts which we know, such like person, place, organization, and the like. And then you would use the Q function to assign scores to each of these uh, classes. Right, and uh, the class which maximizes the Q function would then be the class which would be selected. So in this, in our example here, is the class person as the next class to refine. So basically, where you would apply the so-called your so-called refinement operator. So where will you basically continue like, your search within the space of possible solutions? And uh, yeah, you would continue that until you get to a solution which is such that the Q value is actually either one, basically meaning you've perfectly described your positive and negative examples, or until it's maximized and you've run out of resources, for example, time, okay? So that's the classical way uh, in which those algorithms work. And what you see here is that these algorithms are so-called myopic algorithms. Myopic basically meaning they do not look forward really, or they do not use any further information than the information uh, from the class. So they really have no way of knowing what is, whether person actually has the potential of generating a path which would actually lead to a Q value of one. So in the slides, for the sake of your personal fun, I added a bunch of definitions so that you actually know how this works technically, but we're not going to delve into that. Uh, the problem which I described it describe is basically the problem of myopia. And it turns out that we can use algorithms from reinforcement learning, echo from gaming, really to improve that. Um, and that's the drill algorithm. So it turns out that if you look at, you've probably all heard of um, the last efforts of Google in the area of game, right? Of gaming. So you've heard of AlphaZero, AlphaGo, and the like. Yes. Yeah or nay? Yes, you have. Okay. So the the way these algorithms work, right, is that they start with a bot position. Then they do what is called a Monte Carlo tree search. They basically search through uh, possible moves that you could make. And basically, when they find a move which leads to a win, they back propagate that into the uh, function, which tells you how good your position is. And that's exactly a look ahead. So because they start at a particular position, say the position on the board, and they basically start computing through moves and basically backpropagate them until they have a function approximator, which can tell them by just looking at the position, how good the position is. They have actually used forward knowledge to approximate how good a particular move is. A myopic algorithm would not do that. A myopic algorithm would simply have one equation, look at the current position and say, hey, I get this position looks good for me. This is a set of possible moves. I'm going to look at the position after that one move and basically return a score. And based on that score, I will, be, I will make my move. Um, if you've ever played chess, go or any of those games, you know that that's exactly the way you lose at those games. So what we uh, came up with is really a formulation of the problem based on deep learning. If you think about it, if you think about the tree which we had, you can. So basically, we said that what we're really doing is exploring a tree of possibilities, right? Uh, and we had this Q function, which basically told us how good a state is. What we can do here is look at this as if we were gaming and really say, can we generate games 
maximize the uh, quality of our Q function actually using look ahead, exactly like you would do in gaming, so that when we're faced with a real problem, instead of using a static Q function like used by the algorithm so far, we actually use the <coughs> function used learned by uh, a deep neural network in general, but I'm not going to go into the technicalities thereof, to actually have a better idea of what the best move is vis-a-vis -vis searching for the best possible uh, path through our search tree so that we actually get really a good class expression. So that's fundamentally what uh, this algorithm is all about. So the observation is that if you think about all the classes, you can basically regard them as a set of states. And uh, when we think about the operator, which basically took um, the tree which we had before, and generated the next level of possible states. That's really what we'll call a generator. And, and that would be a generator for what we call state state transition. So basically it tells you which moves you can make, uh, how you can transition from one uh, class to another class expression. And the quality function, this Q function we talked about, really is nothing else than what we call a, a state value approximator. So it basically just tells you how good a particular class expression is with respect to the learning problem which you're trying to solve. Okay, that's really, this is kind of the key slide here. If you understand this, then you understand what we're doing. So we take the problem of searching through a space of classes, we map it really to a reinforcement learning setting where we are actually playing a game of finding the right class expression. And we say, hey, uh, what we can do here is actually learn a better function for traversing the state space. And then we really use that function, that uh, automatically learn function, instead of using a classical function like accuracy or F measure or the like. And it turns out that that actually leads to quite interesting results, which I'm gonna show you in a second. So the formulation here is equivalent to the so-called reinforcement learning uh, setting. Who's never heard of reinforcement learning before? As a term. Okay. So, um, sorry, sorry, I know it. Sorry. Okay, okay. So, our hypothesis is that we can use deep learning to accelerate hypothesis search. And uh, really, when we think about reinforcement learning, we always think about this particular setting where we assume that we have an agent, an agent who are basically can carry out actions. These actions affect an environment, and the environment uh, is in a state. ST and has given the agent a reward RT. The agent performs an action AT, which changes the state of the environment. The environment tells the agent what the new state is and what the reward is. So if you think about a chess board, for example, you, you start with a board where the pieces have not moved yet. You make a move, your opponent makes a move, the environment tells you this is the new state. And once you finish the game, the environment, which is the chess board, or the rules really of the game of chess tells you where tell you whether you have won or not. That would be your reward. So you get a reward of zero until somebody loses, then it's basically either one or zero that you get that reward. And if it's a draw, you get 0 0.5. And your job obviously is to maximize the reward that you will get. And as you can see, it's over a long period of time. So you get a bunch of zeros before you get your real reward value, your final reward value, but you need, you want to use that final reward to actually evaluate positions correctly. And that's exactly the same which we're doing. You want to use knowledge about what a good class expression looks like to evaluate the class expressions we go through. So this is the same thing really in textual form. Major point here is that the goal, our goal is to take actions. So basically, select class expressions in our case, which are such that they maximize what is called the discounted uh, reward or discounted return. And discounted return really is a fancy term for saying maximize the reward over time, right? So the equation really just tells you that at the end, you want to get the maximum possible total reward across the path. But in the kinds of games which we are playing, the reward is basically binary. So it basically says you want to reach a goal, a goal state, a state where you win as quickly as possible. Um, basically, if you remember the um, setting which we had, this top concept which we had, when we did our search, we basically started by search and then we looked for person and the organizations and locations and so on. 
that was the setting which we had. This top concept would be your initial board configuration and your checkmate would be finding an a hypothesis with the F measure of one, basically the perfect hypothesis. And what we're interested in is finding a better quality function, which is which does not have the problem of myopia, ego, which looks further than just one step ahead. Um, so I'm not going to delve into details, but it turns out that you can do that by using a convolutional deep neural network. Um, you've all heard of convolutional deep neural networks, I guess. Or who's never heard of one of those? You've all heard of a convolutional neural network, I guess. Okay, cool. So let me tell you how you do it uh, rather quickly. The idea, I'm going to skip that. That's not that interesting. The idea here is that um, you first learn embed. Oh, that's right. You first learn embeddings. So um, it turns out if you consider a graph, right? You've all dealt with graphs before, and you consider the adjacency matrix of this graph. So this is V1, V2, up to V5. And you consider the adjacency matrix of this graph, right? Um, so this would be V1 up to V5. Each row of this adjacency matrix really gives you a vectoral representation of the nodes, right? So that would be what we would call an embedding. That would be a vector representation of a node in a graph. But it turns out that in knowledge graphs, because we're dealing with hypergraphs, this A is not a matrix, it's a tensor, so it has a third dimension. And because this tensor is going to be large, we need ways to really compress this information. I'm not going to delve into that, but it turns out that there are algorithms which converge relatively quickly uh, in some cases, depends on the algorithm that you use, but which can take such a node and actually gives you gives you a vectoral representation, say in R to the K. So what we do is we take these vectoral representations, and now we have a representation, a convolutional representation, when we stack these vectors of the positive and negative examples. So because we have that, we can actually use a convolutional neural network on top. And we can use a convolution on the network to train the Q function. And the way we train the Q function is by simply generating our problems. So our class expression learning problems, pairs of positive and negative examples where we know what the solution is going to look like. And we can now train really the neural networks to approximate Q, the Q functions we were looking for uh, automatically. The whole process is automatic. You generate the Q function. And once we generate, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but basically you can prove that learning that Q function really converges if you have an infinite number of examples that you're guaranteed to finding the best possible approximation of the Q function. But uh, it turns out that once you have that Q function, you can actually use it then in a space search problem. Um, simply, yeah, simply as you would do, you would have done classically in uh, one of the symbolic machine learning algorithms which I showed you before. So this is, but because we use a neural network actually for the Q function, our algorithm belongs to the family of neurosymbolic uh, machine learning algorithms. But most importantly, the output is a class expression, which means you can't still verbalize the output. You can also verbalize all the steps from the top concept, echo from the first node of your search space up to your solution. So you basically, have this um, desired characteristic of explainability. And um, if you have a few seconds, I'll talk to you about counterfactuals. So drill will work exactly the same way as, as the algorithm I showed before, with the only difference that the Q function, which basically tells you how good it is to be in any of these states, is learned via a deep neural network. Is it any better, you might want to ask? And it turns out that it is. So it uh, it's not only that it achieves perfect F measure on the on benchmark data sets, which have been used for quite a while. Um, this algorithm also performs pretty well. But what's most important is this column. Basically, our algorithm is significantly faster at finding solutions. So basically, if you let uh, the Siloe algorithm long, run long enough, it will find a solution because it's a so-called complete algorithm. But by basically choosing your nodes bet better across the path with the drill algorithm, you can find solutions way faster. And in general, in real life applications, you have a timeout. So drill really performs better than um, the state of uh, the art algorithms, which rely on symbolic learning. But I am... Um, a minute ahead of schedule, uh, a minute behind schedule. So let me just sum up. So the first thing that I wanted to tell you is that 
explainable uh, AI is actually central. It bridges between humans and machine learning algorithms, and it's actually a prerequisite for what we call algorithmic fairness, and uh, for people to actually understand what machine learning algorithms do, and uh, basically also being able to detect algorithms that they shouldn't behave a certain way. Classical XAI approaches are based on feature analysis. You've all done that. Uh, what I want to wanted to point out is that there is a family of algorithms called neurosymbolic learning algorithms, which once deployed on knowledge graphs are anti-hoc explainable because they basically are, are intrinsically explainable. All the models they generate are explainable. They're globally explainable, basically means they don't only explain a portion of their solution space, but the whole thing. And uh, the problem so far has been the scalability, but what we we're able to show is that by use combining deep neural networks with uh, symbolic learning, we actually can make those approaches increasingly more scalable and hence more useful for real life applications. That's the end of the talk, and I'm open for questions. Sorry, I'm. Uh, I think I'm. It took me two minutes longer. So two minutes longer. I apologize. You've been here too long, Axel. <laughs> the two minutes is okay. So there's questions in the chat box. Do you want to just? Uh... Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, Let's start here. Bayesian decision model. Uh, well, as you've seen, we are not really dealing with uh, continuous data necessarily here. So it turns out that the values which you use as the attributes of uh, nodes can be continuous. But this is uh, not regarded as a Bayesian classification problem because you don't really have priors and the like. What you can use though in the deep neural network, you can replace the, neural net, the deep neural network with whatever model you want, as long as it's some form of regression model, which basically predicts the Q value, right? So there you might be able to integrate Bayesian models if you're interested in that, but it's really not a prerequisite in our case. Okay. Um, is there any way to relate the graphs we know to knowledge graphs? It depends on the graphs you know. I don't know which graphs you know. So can you give me an example of the type of graphs you know? This was a question by Steshi Kibika. What do you mean? Uh, okay. The graphs I know are uh, the x, y, and you can, uh, you can increase the number of dimensions. And I see. basically you just try and put your x and y values together. And so basically, yeah, so those are those are uh, functional representations or mapping representations, though that's not what I mean by knowledge graphs. Of course, you could add such functions into a knowledge graph. So there are knowledge graphs for functions, for example, but the two are not related. They are just uh, homonyms, but not synonyms. Okay, assume we run two experiments. Can we apply knowledge graph to see the correlation between two experiments? If yes, how? Why would you want to apply knowledge graphs there? I don't, I'm not sure I understand. So you would, you could in the sense that you could represent the experiments as knowledge graphs. So there is a platform called Hopit, which does exactly that. And uh, based on the results of the experiments, you could actually study which experiments lead to good results. And out of that do what, for example, some people call hyperparameter configuration. So that is definitely a way in which you could exploit knowledge graphs in the field of experiments. And that is the way it is exploited at the moment. So the Hobbit platform, I think there have been, if I recall correctly, roughly 25,000 experiments run there with different configurations of different pieces of software. And you can basically now mine these uh, knowledge graphs which came out of there to actually decide as to which software to use for use, which use cases, for example. Okay, does causal graph mean knowledge graph? The answer is no, but um, there are some causal graphs or basically every causal graph, and let me be cautious here, every discrete causal graph is a knowledge graph uh, with exactly one relation, which is the causality relation. And there is one called uh, CauseNet, which we published last year which basically gives you causal relations between different activities as described in the in the wikipedia so you have relations such as smoking may cause cancer or basically other forms of activities which might lead to certain diseases that would be one of the type or basically a sample of the kinds of things you find in such a causal knowledge graph so yes every causal knowledge graph is a knowledge graph but a causal graph does not mean knowledge graph 
Is there any relation and difference between causal knowledge graph and this knowledge graph? See answer before. How do you define state state transition functions as a fun Oh, this is interesting. How do you define a state state transition function as a function? Is that linear? Slide 23. Um, did I use the term function there? said it's a generator for valid state state transitions i did not say it's a function because actually it is not so um if you assume um if you might assume that you have a, a set of states which we are going to call s what row really does is it maps s to the power set of s and it tells you if you are in a particular state s i then row fsi, this is wrong notation, just a second, it should be bracket, is going to be si1 to sin, and it's going to be a set of states uh, to which you can transition when you are in si. So that would be basically the formal definition here. So it's not a function. It basically uh, maps states to states. You build a graph of states, and because that graph is infinite, what you're really interested in is finding a path through that graph so that you can actually get to the state that you're interested in. What do you think about the improvement of AI, I guess, versus human job? I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you be slightly more precise? Okay, my, my, my question was about what do you think about the improvement of intelligence activity? and uh, human jobs. In the sense of uh, artificial intelligence is taking over human jobs or yeah, artificial yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, I see. Okay, so um, it turns out that there are jobs where um, artificial intelligence is that better. Um, I mean, if you take the job of a, of a chess player, technically humans lose to machines, but it doesn't mean that we want machines to do those jobs. Again, if you take the job of a chess player, what we're interested in knowing is how good can humans be, uh, be at that particular game. We know that machines can be good. And uh, we keep on developing algorithms for that particular game and making them ever better, but it does not replace uh, the human humans basically playing the game. Now, if we think about more day-to-day -day jobs, it seems to me that... Um, Machines are able to take, how do I put this carefully? They are indeed able to take over certain jobs which have been performed by humans. And but that's something we've seen since the Industrial Revolution, really. Uh, I mean, um, back in the days, you would have a horse and a carriage and you would transport ice uh, from one place to the other and uh, hope to deliver it really quickly. Now you have a fridge, which basically does the job for that. It doesn't mean that we have to see that as a threat. On the contrary, it seems to me that we should build up upon that to actually get humans to do jobs where they perform significantly better than machines. And these jobs exist simply because humans are the better sensors. Uh, it seems to me that the direction in which we should go is actually to get machines and humans to work together. If you think about medical doctors, for example, it's been shown that machines are better at detecting certain types of tumors. So it will be cheaper and better to actually take scans and give them to machines, you wouldn't have to go through a doctor and you would have a higher priority, a, a higher probability of your tumor if you have one being detected. But machines are not as good as talking to humans and saying, okay, you probably have cancer. How do we deal with that? What are the next steps, right? So you could basically get a doctor and machine to work together with a machine telling the doctor, this is probably this particular disease, having the human check the results and having the human basically interact with humans and try to find a way to resolve or to address the problem at hand. It turns out as well that when it comes to surgery, humans assisted by robots perform better than humans. So again, that's an area where humans and machines should and can collaborate. So uh, the to keep it short, there are some jobs where machines are better, but those are not all jobs. And I think there's simply going to be a transition in the type of job, jobs which are performed by humans and the types of jobs which are performed by machines. Okay, next question. What do you think about using machine decision in the field of law? Is it a good thing? What about sentiment? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, using machine decision in the field of law has its pros and its cons. So, um, 
The examples that I gave you at the beginning, what I did not tell you is that those machine learning algorithms were trained on human decisions. So those, what those machine learning algorithms showed was that there was a, or there still is a bias in certain justice systems. It's really as simple as that. So in that sense, using machine decision or machine assisted decisions would be is good in the sense that a machine would tell you, an explainable machine learning algorithm would tell you, hey, this is the reason why I suggest that this person goes to jail. And if a human would say, well, why would you suggest that never ever again consider somebody's skin color to decide as to whether the person should, should go to jail or not? You could then retrain the model and have the model make fairer decisions, right? So in that sense, you would have a machine really telling the judge what has been done in the past and helping the judge or humans actually to fix the system. Um, the problem when you use machines in the field of law is especially, it really comes about when the machines are black boxes or when the machines really return feedback to humans who are not the fairest on the planet. But I think using machines in the field of law is a good idea as long as one uses um, explainable and fair models. Is it a good thing? What about sentiment? Um, well, that's a fair question, but the question is how fair is it to use sentiments? Uh, I would suggest that it's not always the fairest thing to do. Not always, let me be very cautious about that. It doesn't mean that we should not use context information. So, um, a uh, somebody stealing a hundred dollars to feed his or her dying kids versus somebody uh stealing a hundred dollars to i don't know buy drugs those are from my perspective two different cases because the contexts are very different but i will not suggest using sentiment for to take judicial decisions have knowledge graphs to remove biases that we saw at the beginning and so or some of them data problems. Well, what knowledge graphs or what this type of machine learning allows you to do is to find those biases and actually fix them, yeah, in the models, basically by discarding uh, machine learning models, which are biased. Okay, thanks. Any last questions? Okay, that's where we are now. What can you give us as advice to improve ourselves and be like you? Oh, please don't be like me. It has already one me on the planet. I'm not sure the planet would survive too. But what I would suggest you to is depending on what you want to do, uh, read up on the state of the art and simply make things happen. That sounds very straightforward, but what I mean is the following. Um, it's, hmm. Getting good at something simply demands a lot of effort. I mean, there's uh, a lot of people ask the question nature versus nurture, and I think it's always both. I'm pretty sure that if you're here, the nature is there, but the nurture basically has to happen and nobody's gonna do that. Nobody's gonna do that for you as good as you can do it for yourself. Ego, learn and learn as much as possible. That's fundamentally the idea. Which systems do you like our trainees to build using AI systems? Innovations could be in terms of better algorithms, data collections, or business models. Um, how does one ask a good question? Oh, I like those questions. Let's start with the first one. Mm, to build using, what should we build using AI systems? Hmm. I would suggest that building things that matter is uh, the uh, answer, and there is a plethora of uh, possibilities in the in the information space. That would be one area where uh, building better algorithms would be really helpful. So it turns out that uh, misinformation, for example, is not only a problem in the states; it's a problem everywhere. Uh, and being able to actually classify information as being reliable or not reliable is a fully open question. And there, there's a lot of potential. Being able to actually explain why information is reliable or unreliable, that's not really been touched so far. And uh, if you can make it happen, then you are, you have a business model that is viable for the whole planet. So that's one area which is practical, but also has a business value. How does one ask a good question? Oh, this is a good, that is, that's a good question. That's how you do it, by asking exactly that question. Uh, how does one ask a good question? 
the, I mean, the, the first question would be, are there any bad questions? I would suggest there aren't. There are questions which get you faster to the goal. Um, and it seems to me that in a lot of cases, this comes with questioning assumptions. Um, so what I always suggest when I teach any course is question my assumptions. If I assume that the distribution is this way, ask yourself, why do I assume that? And by question and assumptions, it turns out that you actually can solve rather fundamental problems or at least spot them. Last question, bike or walk? I prefer walking because I do a lot of thinking when I walk. Question assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> is that a good idea to think while you're walking? And maybe yes. Absolutely. Maybe maybe you would think at higher speed if you were biking. Uh, no, because uh, my my brain uses I think more than the twenty percent of energy which normally a brain uses, so I'll be dead <laughs> when I reach my my end goal. Svench, Svench has one last last question. What do you think about feature? Really, what? I'm not sure I understand the question. What do you think about feature? Will it go with knowledge or course or craft? Are you talking about feature engineering, feature extraction? I'm not sure what you mean. Could you could you elaborate? Um, the the question was a disjunction. So do you mean feature engineering or or uh, feature selection? You can also just pick up. That would do the trick as well. Spencer, are you able to unmute? Okay. Uh, good evening. Greetings. So my question is, what do you think? Uh, so I am a pure mathematician and I want yeah. to, so I, I, I like your presentation first. So Thanks. I, I, I want to know that so for I mean to to do the research, is that better to go with knowledge graphs or casual graphs? Oh, to for the that... point of your research, uh, it mm -hmm. seems to me that uh, knowledge graphs being a superset of causal graphs, it makes sense to look at the research on knowledge graphs, which has been performed uh, out there. And basically, if you want, you may, you may want to apply it on. You can apply it onto causal graphs. But uh, yeah, the uh, larger field of research is definitely knowledge graphs, and that's where I would go. There are pretty good papers at conferences, like uh, basically all the major machine learning conferences have knowledge graphs in there. Paul, do you have a question? Axel, we can see your screen. Can you? Oh, I didn't know that. Thanks. Sorry, my wife is asking whether it's dinner time. So yeah. she's basically telling, dude, move on. <laughs> it's funny because my wife's also writing me messages. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so it's both of us. <laughs> OK, last question then. Any bottlenecks to look after before approaching machine learning for a solution? Well, I would definitely check the assumption of the machine learning model. It turns out that for a lot of the data that's out there, some of the assumptions don't make sense. So a uh, standard assumption would be that you have a certain error distribution, for example, in your in your data, you might want to check that, or that your measurements really have non-Gaussian error, or that you're dealing with discrete data when the data is actually continuous, and so on and so forth. So again, check assumptions before using particular models. Paul, see the last, last question. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very, thank you very much, Professor Alex Axel, for your presentation. We really Pleasure. love it. I want. I just have one. Uh, two personal concern. Are yeah. you from DRC, right? Congo, no. Congo DRC? No, I'm not. Cameroon. Y your name sounds Congolese. But it's not. So check the assumption. <laughs> okay, Palsy, come on. What's, what's your question? Uh, no. It, it was just to confirm about his nationality and ah. where his name is coming because the name uh, Gunga sounds really Congolese. Cameroonian from the east, the western part of Cameroon. 
So Axel, thank yes. you. Um, Pleasure. It was really interesting to have you. I have to admit that I, a lot of it uh, went over my head. But as you said, I think if one is interested in learning or it depends on what one fo wants to focus on. Um, I'm curious to see how the challenge, how the challenge develops. Um, so I'm sure I don't know if we'll manage it in this batch. But yeah, thank you. Thank you oh, for your presentation. What's my pleasure? What's my and pleasure? The, and the applications. Um, I'm curious to see how where the trainings will go out into the world. I think when the trainings that you spoke to last time, I think we mentioned most of them are out in the world of work. Oh, wow. Um, okay, cool. We, yeah, we got there were 28 people who are now working. I think some other people are also working who we have somehow lost touch with. But yeah, I hope to stay in touch or I'm looking forward to staying in touch. Of course. And yeah, thank you. I don't know. I've thank you, guys. Thank you for all for listening. Uh, Enjoy your dinner for those who are having dinner. <laughs> okay. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.